Good evening. I'll call this meeting to order. Mr. Miller, will you, will you read this in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, if you'll call the roll. Councilmember Bruins. Present. Councilmember Daniels. Here. Councilmember Miller. Here. Vice Mayor Schaefer. Here. And Mayor Middleton. Here. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed caption and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replays on Monday, August 29th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at the city's YouTube channel. Next item. Next item is approval of agenda. Move approval. Second. second. Motion by Daniels, second by Miller. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Next item, please. Next item is public comment. Members of the public may address the council on any agenda item of interest to the public and within the council's purview or on any agenda item before or during the council's consideration of the item. Speakers will be limited to three minutes each. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please either complete a speaker identification sheet and give it to myself. If participating via Zoom, use the raise hand function or star nine from a telephone to indicate your desire to speak. When your name is called, I will allow you to unmute your microphone to speak. Do we have any public comment from Zoom? Yes, I do have one public comment from Zoom. Let's take it. Would you like to take that one first? Yes, please. Okay. Lisa Strange, you um, can now unmute yourself to speak for three minutes. Great, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, and City Clerk. Uh, my name is Lisa Strange, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the California Department of Insurance Community Relations and Outreach Branch. I wanted to share two resources that I think would benefit the City of Citrus Heights and its residents. The first is the California Low Cost Automobile Insurance Program, which was established by the legislature in 1999 as a state sponsored program that requires insurance companies to offer affordable liability auto insurance to licensed drivers that meet certain requirements. To be eligible, eligible for the program, consumers must have a valid California driver's license, own a vehicle valued at $25,000 or less, meet income eligibility guidelines, be at least 16 years of age, and have a good driving record. The annual premiums in California vary by county. In Sacramento, you can get this insurance for as low as $317 per year. If you wanna see if you qualify or locate a certified agent in your local area, folks can visit mylowcostauto.com or call 866 602 8861. And then the second resource that I wanted to share is called the Senior Gateway. And it is a website which is a one stop shop for seniors, their families, and caregivers. It's a partnership between many government agencies with everything in one spot. We realized a couple years ago that lots of agencies are running websites to help folks, but it's, you know, you'd have to go to each different website. So we came together and made one spot. On this portal, you will find information on topics such as avoiding and reporting abuse and neglect, preventing fraud, financial abuse, and common scams, um, as well as healthcare information. And that website is seniors.ca.gov. And I just wanted to leave you tonight with this. If you have questions about your current insurance policy, a new policy, or you've been denied coverage, a claim, or canceled, you can call our consumer hotline at 800-927-4357 or visit our website, 
Again, it's the California Department of Insurance at www.insurance.ca.gov. And I also wanted to say that I did mail some low cost auto rack cards as well as some senior gateway postcards. So I want to thank Brenda Anderson for helping me get those to you folks. So if you have those, great. And if you need more, please let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor? Yes. Could we ask her to repeat on the low cost auto, the website and the phone number again? Certainly. I'm mylowcostauto.com. And the phone number is 866-602-8861. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have three speaker cards. One is for item eight, and I have two that are just general comment. If I could have uh, Thomas Spencer, uh, followed by Michael Lagermessina. Okay. I don't know. It's been a while. Hello, my name's Thomas Spencer. I'm a, a citizen of Citrus Heights. Uh, thank you for having and hearing me, council members. Boy, this thing is low. Uh, I'm here today to speak uh, about a topic which came out of a discussion of Area 5 meeting last Thursday. Uh, consensus of the attendees felt it might be a good idea if the city as a promotional and a connection and just to kind of clean up things a little bit, might have a name, the, and we can't call it anything because it doesn't have a designation, but the green area on Greenback that uh, uh, we put in there where Up and Away is, if you were around in those days. I, uh, I call it a green area. Uh, it doesn't have a designation. And uh, the members of the meeting thought it would be great to have a name, the park, or something along that lines. And, and I thought giving it a designation would be very useful for just being able to discuss it uh, throughout city business. So that is what I'm here for. If there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, I thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Michael Lager Messina. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My uh, reason for being up here actually has very little to do with the City Council, but it has to do with the upcoming election. As a former president of the REACH Board and a REACH Board member for the last 13, 14, or 15 years, I can't remember when I started, and a Neighborhood Association president, this year we have three distinct uh, districts having elections, and I believe we have nine candidates at this time. I wish to remind the candidates, the REACH Board, and the Neighborhood Associations that they may not endorse any member of, that are running for the uh, City Council as a body. However, and neither may the candidates expect that endorsement. Individually, they're perfectly willing, or they're perfectly allowed to endorse separately as individuals, but they cannot uh, endorse as a body. Every once in a while we do have uh, where there's a little violation, I'm just gonna remind them that uh, that law is written, or not law, but that is written to each one of the bylaws of the Neighborhood Association and the REACH Board itself. As I said, individually you can support any candidate you wish, but as a body, you may not. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is presentation number four, presentation by Sacramento Area Council of Governments on the 2024 blueprint, the big picture, long range regional planning. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. <clears throat> Tonight, James Corliss, the Executive Director of SACOG, will provide a short presentation and answer any Council questions on the 2024 blueprint. 
The presentation will highlight how a triple bottom line approach that strives to advance co-equal goals in equity, economy, and environment is imperative to prepare the region to meet the complex growth and mobility challenges we all face in the coming decades. The presentation will also provide an overview of the opportunities SACOG is creating to allow for public and stakeholder involvement in the regional planning process and a glimpse into the many programs that SACOG has available or is developing to support public agencies in the implementation of the region's vision for the future. And with that, I will turn it over to James Corliss for the presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Mayor Middleton and council members. Good evening. Nice to be here. Um, a excellent introduction. I really just am here to give you a bit of a preview for this big upcoming long-range plan for the region that will literally go all the way out to 2050, if you can imagine uh, this region in 2050. Um, but it's a, it's a big deal, and this plan in particular uh, and we're, this is, again, it's a preview tonight, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of the initiatives that we think are super exciting that are already implementing our last plan and that I think your city and your staff have made great, taken great advantage of in the last few years. Uh, we'll be back next year in 2023 with all of the public engagement and a lot of the work around this plan. So, so uh, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have Mayor Middleton uh, represent Citrus Heights on the SACOG Board of Directors. I uh, just remind everybody and those in the audience and viewing at home, uh, we're a pretty unique regional agency in that we cover a lot of uh, area, six counties, 22 cities, and for, for a regional agency that's this big and covers this much territory, every single local government has a seat on our board. That is very unusual. You don't find that a lot uh, in, either in California or around the United States. So twice a month we come together in committees in a full board. Um, to largely work on uh, uh, growth and mobility and air quality and quality of life issues um, and uh, this upcoming plan. So uh, it has a long name that we used to use an acronym, MTPSCS. Uh, we try not to use acronyms, so that's the last time you'll hear me say that tonight, I hope. We're rebranding it Blueprint because the plan should be adopted in 2024, uh, and that'll be the 20th anniversary of the original regional Blueprint that this region came together on and adopted back in 2004, which was a voluntary compact, a voluntary vision for how this region should grow, phase its growth, balance between uh, revitalizing existing neighborhoods, revitalizing suburbs and new greenfield. Uh, and, and that was a really important plan, took several years to create 20 years ago, in part because uh, from very far-sighted people back then, showed the region a vision of the future that did not look good. It looked like it was choked with traffic, that infrastructure wasn't keeping up with growth, uh, and it didn't look good to any of the policymakers or the residents 20 years ago, and so they came up with a blueprint. I want to remind you, that was a bottom-up uh, visionary document, and again, we're, we're branding this next plan the blueprint because we feel like we need to be about as visionary as, as we were back in 2004. Now, um, you probably all know this, and maybe you know this if you're at the supermarket or on the roads or anywhere else, we are a fast-growing region. The last census in 2020 actually pegs us in California as a six-county region, as the fastest-growing region in California. So that's unusual, and the coastal cities and the coastal regions are beginning to lose population. And again, that we've seen even the pandemic accelerate that trend, right? People moving to this region, people moving to the foothills, to Tahoe, and now even our economy is really elongated over into the Reno, uh, Nevada region from the Bay Area. So we're a fast-growing region, but if you look out to 2050 in the last 10 to 15 years, we believe we are going to slow. The forecasts are that our growth will slow. It'll be fast in the next decade, and it will begin to slow. There is still a lot of growth ahead of us. Um, we are not a shrinking region, um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting demographic trend that, we, that we're seeing all over the United States, and we'll probably, we'll probably keep going pretty fast, but again, last 10 to 15 years of that, that plan horizon, 2035 to 2050, our growth rate will slow. Uh, as was said, uh, the framework for this plan is really one of balancing uh, these goals around equity, uh, access to opportunity, economic uh, prosperity, and environmental sustainability. I think all goals that are very relevant to your community. Um, we are largely known for transportation, and for all kinds of reasons, even though we're a council of governments, our, our JPA bylaws say 
We come together to solve problems on behalf of the region. The tools which we are given are largely transportation and really technical assistance around housing and economic development. So that's kind of how you know us, maybe even primarily for transportation. Uh, I think, again, over the last few years, since I've been here five years now, your staff has made, taken great advantage of a lot of our funding programs. The Auburn Boulevard uh, reinvestment and complete streets work has been funded. Um, I, I also believe that some of the work around Safe Routes to School and the, um, um, uh, some of the uh, elementary schools here have been funded. We just provided a competitive grant award to the, to the city for retail to rooftops to really reimagine some of your uh, infill housing opportunities. But again, transportation is sort of maybe our bread and butter, the thing we're known for. Um, we will have another funding round for transportation coming up this fall. Um, so, uh, so stay tuned for that. And I, I think I don't have to tell you about the challenges that are ahead in transportation. Another challenge I will, I will put on the table for you is, um, and I know there's going to be an initiative on the ballot coming up in November um, that, that will look to levy a half cent sales tax increase for transportation purposes. Even if that passes, we, are, we, are, we have to think lean, and we have to think that we're on a budget in this region for transportation. We got to think smarter. We have to think more creatively to get people from point A to point B, because we will never have the resources uh, to be able to build everything we say we want to build, right? So we got to get smarter about what we do. It may mean that rather than a lot of light rail extensions, we're going to have some of them, don't, don't worry, but rather than everywhere with light rail, it might be that we're looking at rapid buses. We're looking at uh, signal timing and arterial improvements. Um, it may be we're looking at technology and autonomous vehicles and shared mobility. Uh, those are the answers that I think are maybe more cost effective. Uh, but transportation is a big part of this upcoming blueprint plan, uh, and we're working very closely with your staff on what are the investment projects and the reinvestment revitalization safety projects throughout your community that are, that are really important. I said this plan will be different, um, and it'll part, in part it'll be different because starting next year in 2023, when we come back around to you and really the community and the residents, we want to get people engaged. We want to provide some pretty distinct what we call pathways or alternative futures that the, the region can begin to see, okay, what if, what if we, and just per my next slide, um, what if we had an outward, what if we didn't invest in our existing neighborhoods? What if, what if our existing neighborhoods, even our suburbs, struggled and we went more of an outward growth trajectory? If, what if greenfield development was faster than, than sort of revitalization of existing places? Um, what if for some of our, not just cities, but our, our suburbs lost population? And the sort of the light blue here is kind of the future growth areas or the more recently developing growth areas, and the dark blue, of course, are the existing communities. So, so in this case, I don't have the results yet, but pathway one would uh, focus about only 40% on sort of revitalizing existing urban and suburban communities and 60% on an outward growth trajectory. And you can see here from the different um, sort of alternatives, uh, alternative two is about two thirds existing communities, one third new development, and then um, scenario three with a very big emphasis on revitalizing existing cities and suburbs. Our blueprint that I mentioned back from 2004 was really a balanced portfolio between urban, revi urban infill, suburban revitalization, and phased greenfield development that doesn't get ahead of our ability to provide infrastructure. Now, that's not easy to do, but that's the strategy that we've had on the books for 20 years. And when I mentioned in 2023, we're going to need your help, and we want to get your residents involved, uh, we mean that. And we don't, I'm happy to come back here and stand at the dais, but really we want to go to where people are. We want your help and your ideas about how to go to community events and farmers markets and flea markets and where, you know, wherever we can get out and actually talk to people, uh, get a sense of their priorities, um, their, how they see transportation, housing, growth, quality of life, safety issues. Uh, that's what we want to do uh, next year. So again, a little bit of the timing on the plan. Uh, this is really the setup year. We're doing a lot of work with your staff. This is a very complicated and somewhat technical exercise because this plan is the plan we need at the state level and the federal level to be able to compete for uh, competitive dollars, for transportation dollars, housing dollars. Um, we need this plan and we need it to be blessed by the Air Resources Board, um, state agencies at the state level in California and, and, uh, and the feds as well. So 2023, a big year for education and outreach, those three pathways, alternative growth scenarios, 
We'll be doing elected in, uh, official information sessions uh, as well as a lot of resident and community engagement. Um, we'll, the, our board of directors will be picking a preferred pathway towards the middle uh, to late in the year of 23, and then we're looking at a 2024 adoption of our plan. So that's what's coming. That's the setup and, and my pitch about how important that is. And I just want to, I want to just reference a few things here that are the initiatives because the plan can kind of feel a little far away or the future, or I can't imagine 2050. I'm happy if I'm here in 2050, right? But what's happening today? So we've got, I think, some really exciting initiatives, and many of you are, have, have been aware of these or part of these. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a few of them because part of our job is to take that big plan and our aspirations and translate them into something where we can go get state funding and federal funding. We can convince uh, the legislature and Congress that we are we are investment ready, that we are worthy of investment. This is a really interesting effort that we have. I mentioned the sort of the uh, the decline in the growth rates in the coasts and the and the fast paced growth here in the Sacramento region, uh, which you know certainly can be a double edged sword. But we are working very closely with our counterparts in the San Francisco nine county Bay Area and Northern San Joaquin Valley and the San Joaquin Council of Governments and a mega region working group. We've identified 12 projects across our 16 counties. I mentioned before this kind of, if you think of 50 and 80, that's really the, the elongation of our economy in Northern California. And partly what we wanna to do too, as the Bay Area continues to experience very high housing costs is we wanna be partly an alternative for companies to move here, right? We wanna get office up here. We wanna get uh, workers up here. We don't want them moving out of state. We want our, our, a lot of our companies to think of this mega region as a much more affordable, mobile uh, uh, mega region, 16 counties with a great quality of life. So to do that, we're looking at, in, we're looking at transportation investments here uh, that I think are pretty exciting. In about 12 to 18 months, we'll have the ACE Rail from San Joaquin Valley, sorry, from Silicon Valley, San Jose, Tri-Valley, up through Stockton, extended into Sacramento, uh, actually up to the Sacramento International Airport with a, with a study underway right now to look to go north to Marysville and Chico. The Capital Corridor, uh, which uh, I know you're involved in, uh, very exciting, one of the most high, highly ri high ridership of the Amtrak corridors in our country, connects the South Bay, the East Bay, Oakland, uh, with Sassoon, Fairfield, UC Davis, Sacramento. We're providing, a, and, and it, with partners, investing in a third track between Sacramento and Roseville to basically get 10 to 12 trains a day up to Roseville, then Auburn, and another feasibility study going across the top to Truckee and then Reno. So if you think about those two kind of passenger rail armatures, this, this isn't high-speed rail. This is just medium speed effective rail that people will ride and that we can get faster and can connect us again to the Northern San Joaquin Valley and the Silicon Valley. We're also looking at I-5, uh, I-80. We have got a project within partnership with Placer County uh, to look at investments in this 80, I-80 corridor right here going across into the International Airport. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in this mega region working group. Um, I know you guys have fabulous trails in Citrus Heights. You've been a big part of developing a regional trail vision to connect every single community across six counties with trails. So imagine in the future you could get on a bike, electric bike, uh, scooter, skateboard, wheelchair, without crossing, without being on a busy road, cross a few busy roads, but between every, among every single community in this region. It's a game changer. Um, and frankly, if you look at the trail network now, and again, I know you've got great trails in Citrus Heights, we've got the American River Parkway, we've got some great trails all over the region, but they are disconnected. They don't actually connect. Um, they don't get people where they want to go. So this is a, obviously a sort of a stylized version uh, on our website is a much more detailed version. Uh, and I will just tell you, I, if I look at that and I sort of zoom back, Citrus Heights is in, you're, you're in the middle of the whole thing. You're in the middle of Placer County, El Dorado County, the many trails come through your, your, your city. Uh, and I think that's a really exciting thing. As a parent of three teenagers, I'm tired of driving them places. I want them to have a, a safe place to, to get. And if we had more trails, um, I'd be a happier person. So uh, just a few more. Um, we are, um, I mentioned the three E's, equity, economy, environment. We're working very closely with a lot of our economic partners, Greater Sacramento Economic Council, 
um, Sacramento Asian Pacific Chamber, and the Metro Chamber, we, d we launched and developed a prosperity strategy for the six county region, and basically that strategy says we can no longer rely on being a government town. I probably don't have to convince you of that, but it is not an economy that is going to last or is sustainable. Instead, we have to be intentional about at least three sectors that we think are, are already emerging and going to pop. One is food and ag and ag tech. Uh, the second is um, biotech, health and life sciences. And the third is advanced mobility. Um, so all, those three really should be our play in this entire region. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. But um, I think there's some really exciting, again, the sort of the, the technology coming out of Silicon Valley, especially for transportation, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, can be deployed here. We can be a test bed. We can be a, a place for pilot projects uh, because we are the perfect region for that. And then finally, I'll end here, um, our next generation of leaders someday um, sitting in my seat and your seats around the SACOG board table, right, will be this generation of high school students. We run a youth leadership academy for high school students across the six counties. And it's pretty awesome to see high school students mingle and mix with other high school students from counties that they've never even, you know, they don't know much about, right? Um, actually, there's a great project in our first, we've done four years of this, our first year, um, some youth up in Yuba County and Marysville did a project to re-envision the old downtown Marysville Hotel. And now <laughs> they just uh, launched a proposal to actually make, turn that hotel back into housing. Um, you know, th those, those kids had a vision. Obviously, a lot of the elected leaders uh, followed through on that. Uh, we definitely have kids from Citrus Heights and students from Citrus Heights participate. We're about to go recruit the next, the next class of these students. And if any of you want to come talk to them, they love it when elected officials come, come talk and tell them about your journey in, in, in public service. We have members of Congress and state legislators, and this is really a chance to get kids excited about the future because, frankly, um, it is these folks who we are planning for in those long-range plans. So with that, um, thanks for having me. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, thanks so much for coming tonight. It's exciting news. And I just wanted to um, uh, acknowledge where it all started back 20 years ago when our very own first mayor, Bill Hughes, was one of the f uh, proponents, advocates, and founding members of, a, of the blueprint. Um, and it's nice to see how far you've come. He would be very happy. That's fantastic. So I have one request. Can I get a copy of your presentation? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to see it. Yeah. I'd love to study it. Absolutely. We can send you all kinds of stuff. Okay. <laughs> be, be, be careful with that. Be careful that. what you yeah. ask for. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, James. Great yeah. presentation. And as always, you know, I'm very passionate about the work that we do at CCOG. And it makes a real difference. And um, thank you so much for coming out and speaking to us. We, we, we honestly see you all as a bit of a bellwether community. We know you're, you're in some ways you're hemmed in, you're landlocked, right? And I think many of our communities are already there or will be there soon. And so the question is, right, how do you, I mean, that's why actually I, I love your motto and, your, and the, everything you've done and thought about that, right? Because how do we keep growing even if we actually can't go out, right? How do you maintain a great quality of life and a great place for families? So, so you've got a great staff. You guys are very engaged in SACOG and really appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, please. Next item is comments by council members and regional board updates. All right, Mr. Miller, what have you been up to? Well, I just got back from camping at Lake Tahoe, but I did have a chance to attend the RT meeting virtually from the campground, and nothing of note for uh, uh, Citrus Heights. We did have an uh, electrical emergency where we needed four-fifths of a vote, and we couldn't get the one director we needed uh, to attend, so we have to do that in a couple weeks. So that emergency still exists. Um, but I did want to mention uh, the free rides from regional transit for any kid, K through 12, just go to the SACRT website and uh, sign up. And this is a little devious adult thing. We want the kids to start riding transit and see what it's like and know how to navigate uh, both the bus system and light rail. So you know how that works when you're a parent. Trick them into <laughs> trying something. So that's all I have to report today. Okay, Mr. Daniels. Um, had an air board meeting today. Nothing to report out of it right now. Just going to follow up on something that happened with that and then report back in two weeks. And that's it. Thank you. Ms. Burns. Thank you. 
The regional SAN um, met yesterday and we had a couple of uh, really significant things that were reported on. First of all, we have this harvest water program, which is where we recapture the water that's gone through the treatment plant and is flowing down the Sacramento River, and we use it for um, uh, irrigating farmland, parks, um, golf courses, and so forth, but mainly farmland. And that program has been ba mainly grant funded and it's very exciting. I wish that we had it up here, but we're all built out and we don't really have the, the opportunity to, to irrigate farmland in Citrus Heights. So uh, this is an ongoing program. Uh, the, the district has won several national awards for conservation, for recapturing our own water rather than sending it all down to Southern California and using it uh, as a local resource in our own area. So it was very exciting to see how far, how far that, along that has come. And secondly, um, there has been a, uh, has been talk for a long time, many years actually, about two things that are kind of infrastructure things within regional SAN. One is um, to uh, talk about future sta staffing. So regional S sanitation district and Sacramento S sewer district are two s districts that get our sewage down to the, the wastewater treatment plant. And, um, but their employees are county employees. They're not regional SAN employees. So we've had a discussion, I've served on a subcommittee to take a look at and, and analyze this. And so um, this is an ongoing um, effort and we're talking with the county about it. Um, some of the challenges are that our, our job classifications within regional SAN and within the county are, don't sync with each other. So uh, we did uh, recommend that the staff move it forward. Uh, we had three options uh, to choose from and the third one being somewhat of a hybrid option. So that is an ongoing uh, effort and that will we'll be moving forward uh, throughout this year and into next year and I think the end result will be that regional SAN will have their own employees at least in the large part. The second part of that is the fact that since regional SAN and SAC sewer have been, um, well regional SAN consolidated 35 or 40 years ago a lot of little sanitation districts into one big one. We've had two districts. We've had what I've often called here the big pipes and the little pipes and so um, we're looking at that as a uh, maybe a passe model and the opportunity to consolidate them into one district. Um, for there, not only would there be economies of scale, uh, but there would be uh, it would resolve some redundancy, and so that got a lot of interest from the board as well. So we've we've directed staff to continue to look at that. The plan um, would be uh, implemented without loss of jobs, so that's a key component of that. Um, and so that that will be studied by a subcommittee going on too. But so those are two very large uh, structural changes within regional SAN as it moves forward to serve uh, the rest of this decade and, and on into the future. And the only other thing I wanted to bring up is I just wanted to uh, acknowledge and honor one of our citizens, um, Jim Cook, who is the older brother of Bill Cook, who we all, most of us know through the, region, or the Citrus Heights Community Marching Band. He and his wife, Kathy, formed that about 20 years ago. Well, Jim Cook and his wife, Bertha, used to sit right over there in our city council meetings in the old building, every council session, and eventually he brought little brother Bill and Kathy along. And Jim passed away Sunday evening, and so I just, he, he gave a lot to this community. He was 82. And so there will be a viewing on the 1st of September from 4 to 8 at Reichert's funeral house. And then the following day on the 2nd at 10 a.m. there will be a service under the gazebo at Sylvan Cemetery for anyone who would like to attend and honor him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Schaefer. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I didn't have any board meetings, uh, but I did speak at uh, both the Area 5 and the Area 10 meetings. I was delighted to see such a great turnout at both meetings. Uh, the questions were very engaging. 
Uh, and the excitement is clear that uh, people are excited about coming back together after pandemic. Uh, they're excited about the direction the city is heading. Um, and so there were some really, uh, and I want to thank uh, Mary Poole and um, Hunter Young uh, for presenting at the, um, and there was, there's going to be some redevelopment happening on the sort of the south end of uh, uh, Sylvan Road or San Juan Avenue. Um, so uh, very informative, appreciate that. Um, and so that was great. And like I said, very engaging. I also want to take a minute to thank uh, Michael Lagomarsino. I just want to help clarify a little bit on why it's important that, um, that no endorsements go out from the neighborhood associations on an official basis. Um, so uh, REACH, which is the Residence Empowerment Association of Citrus Heights, is a 5013C um, C3 uh, nonprofit and uh, endorsements by a nonprofit for political purposes are um, against the IRS code. So they could jeopardize their, um, their, uh, their nonprofit status by uh, endorsing any candidate. So thank you, Michael. I appreciate that you uh, bringing that forward. Um, and one other thing is on a more fun note is uh, today, uh, August 25th, is National Banana Split Day. <laughs> uh, it's August 25th, National uh, Banana Split Day, and believe it or not, the banana split was invented in a pharmacy. Uh, not in, a, in a, an ice cream shop, and it was a pharmaceutical apprentice that actually, uh, they had a soda fountain, because the soda fountains were in the, um, at that time, in the pharmacies, and he was experimenting, <laughs> and he had a hit, he had a, and so the co local college students were willing to pay double uh, the cost from a, an ice cream sundae. And so that was happened in 1904. So go out and have a nice banana split tonight. Vice Mayor, I'm, I'm buying if you're paying. <laughs> <laughs> have a great, have a great time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to report, so we'll just move on to the next item, please. The next item is consent al calendar items five and six. What's the pleasure of the council? <laughs> I'll move approval. Second by Bruins. Okay, motion by Bruins. I will give the second to Vice Mayor Schaefer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? So moved. Next item, please. The next item is regular calendar, item number seven. The subject is designation of voting delegate and alternates for the League of California Cities Annual Conference. The recommendation is that the City Council designate a voting delegate and up to two alternates to participate at the annual business meeting on September 9th, 2022, during the League of California Cities Annual Conference. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members, Haley Reed, Management Analyst with the City Clerk's Office. Tonight, I bring before you an item to designate a voting delegate for the League of California Cities Annual Conference. The voting delegate will represent the City of Citrus Heights at the annual business meeting taking place on Friday, September 9th. There are no resolutions to be voted on during the business meeting this year, but the voting delegate will vote to accept amendments to the League bylaws, and the packet was included in your agenda packet. The only council member currently registered to attend the conference is Mayor Middleton. So with that, staff recommends the city council designate a voting delegate to participate at the annual business meeting during the League of California Cities annual conference. If you have any questions, please let me know. I move that we nominate <laughs> Mayor Middleton. Second. Motion by Bruin, second by Miller. All those in favor? Aye. 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 You Opposed. can't even take a step back. <laughs> okay, motion passes. Next item, please. Next item is regular calendar item number eight. The subject is community block party trailer program approval. The recommendation is that the city council approve the Citrus Heights <coughs> community block party trailer program.
Okay, good evening, Mayor Middleton and members of City Council. I'm Megan Huber, Economic Development and Community Engagement Director. Along with me is... Chris Myers, General Services Department. Excuse me. And we have a really fun and exciting agenda item to present to you this evening. It's a culmination of council direction that originated at our latest strategic planning retreat on May 10th. City Council gave staff a goal to present to you for consideration a proposal to purchase and outfit a Citrus Heights block party trailer available to community groups to rent stocked with essentials to host events. And as background for the public, this specific goal is a part of a larger community goal that has been set via uh, a strategic work plan memo that will be implemented over the course of the next two years. In total, it has four categories, and this goal in particular is directly related uh, to the second category, uh, which is to increase community connection here at the city of Citrus Heights. As we emerge from COVID-19 and public health orders, um, we know our, our residents and community champions are really hungry to come back together. So staff brainstormed ideas on uh, how we would be able to do that and received this goal from city council and have been very enthusiastic to work on it. Uh, at May 26, City Council uh, received a presentation on plans for the community block party trailer scope. And on June 23rd, there was a budget update to allocate $50,000 of American Rescue Plan Act funding for project implementation, which means we were off to the races to be able to procure everything needed to be able to make this exciting project happen. And here are the results so far. The block party trailer will be available to rent for neighborhood associations and community groups to host neighborhood events. The block party trailer will come stocked with all the essentials to host a neighborhood block party, including tables, chairs, coolers, barricades, cones, lawn games, a Bluetooth small sound system, trash receptacles, and, a, and a, quite a few other items as well. Uh, so I want to take a quick minute to expand on the definition of community groups. There are a plethora of really important community groups in Citrus Heights that make up our community fabric. Uh, you heard earlier from our neighborhood associations as well as REACH, their governing body. We also have our Connect Citrus Heights group. Uh, whose creation was a strategic goal, and it is uh, the entire depth and breadth of community groups. So everything from religious organizations to uh, amateur sports organizations to our Chamber of Commerce and business associations, the list goes on and on. So uh, uh, a great goal that will be achieved with the implementation of this project is to give them uh, both the figurative and literal means to increase community connection and provide ready infrastructure. So uh, hypothetically, on this day next year, Neighborhood Association 5 could host a national banana split party. <laughs> So uh, the action item before you this evening is to review and uh, consider approval of the program guidelines. Staff did extensive research on other jurisdiction programs really across the nation to make sure we were designing just right for our community and our intentions. Uh, so for eligibility, as I mentioned, this will be available to Citrus Heights neighborhood associations and community groups and other similar groups who are registered with our community engagement team. This will be the first program rolled out of our community engagement portion of the Economic Development and Community Engagement Department. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, the definition of community group, our intention is to make it as wide as possible. Um, in terms of eligibility, individual residents and businesses would not be eligible to reserve because the intention really is to bring community groups together, not make this available for private events. May I ask a question about that? Absolutely. So, um, what if a, um, 
a neighborhood watch group, which are all private volunteer citizens, mm -hmm. or a group of neighbors within a, a development wanted to host a, a, an event for all of their neighbors so they could, they're individuals, but if they came together as a group to do it, could they do it? Yes, we would figure out how to register them as a subgroup, hopefully, of a neighborhood association. Um, that really pulls through the thread of this program creating value for neighborhood associations to come and work together. Well, I'm not talking about the formal neighborhood associations. I'm talking about a group of neighbors who wanted to host a neighborhood event for their development, let's just say there's 100 homes in it. Mm -hmm. But they're, they don't have, they're, they're not an HOA, they're just people. Sure. They wanted to come together to, to um, achieve the very thing this is for, which is to bring out their neighbors, get to know each other, and have a barbecue or whatever. Absolutely. Could they do that? Yes. We would figure out how to make that happen, and we can talk through that, uh, what that would look like a little bit more in the application process to give you a better idea of the functionality of the program. So, uh, and Chris, I have one through five, right? Um, so, uh, to reserve the trailer, reservations would be based on availability and on a first come, first serve basis. Um, we would like to give preference to groups who are reserving for the first time to make sure we're catalyzing new community connection. And uh, we ask that reservations be made no sooner than six months in advance to the event and no later than two weeks before the event because whether we like it or not, there is some paperwork to be done and we have to make time for it. Uh, the reservation process begins once the application is submitted to community engagement and we'd ask that it be received uh, no less than 30 days prior to the event date. So the process, and Councilmember Bruins, hopefully this can answer that question a little more here. Um, to begin, an interested party would complete the block party trailer application and submit it to community engagement, and we'll register that organization or group and confirm the dates available and arrange a drop-off and pickup time and location. Now, the next step will be for these applicants to complete a rental agreement and program waiver, including proof of insurance information. The community group or individual representing a community group can utilize their own event insurance, providing it meets minimum policy requirements, or they can utilize the event insurance that is offered through the city as well, which is a great resource. Um, event insurance requirements will vary based on the location of the event. So um, the main differentiator there is if we're hosting an event on public or private property, what we would be looking for in an application, um, Council Member Bruins, to answer your question, if it is an individual in a neighborhood wanting to host a block party, we would be looking for that to be in a public location. Um, so they would file for a street closure permit to host a, a classic version of a, a block party and we would make sure that gets through. If it's, a, if it's private property, a good example of that would be, mm, let's say, Let's say folks come together uh, and want to have a taco extravaganza in a surplus parking, a, a commercial surplus parking lot right outside their neighborhood, and they get that property owner's approval. That would be on private property, which would uh, require a different style of event insurance and that property owner's approval. So um, the process of approval will look a little bit like a flow chart, and we'll design that to make sure it's very clear for applicants, and uh, the management analyst with community engagement will liaison with the applicant the entire time to make it as simple a process as possible. Does that answer your question, Councilmember Bruins? Okay, fantastic. Um, so so as I mentioned, depending on the location, there would be applicable permits. Um, public locations would require a street closure permit. Um, varied locations could require also a temporary use permit. We would make sure that's very clear in the program materials, which would be uh, very uh, smartly branded as well. Okay, trailer deliveries and pickup would only occur during normal business hours, Monday through Friday at a pre-approved location the applicant must be over 21 year, an applicant over 21 must be present at the time of the drop off for orientation and pickup for inspection applicant may not relocate or move the trailer at any time 
A city employee will pick up the block party trailer agreed during an agreed upon time window on a Monday morning following the neighborhood event. So as I mentioned, the community block party trailer program will be the first community engagement program rolled out of the newly formed Economic Development and Community Engagement Department. Program launch is anticipated in the fourth quarter of this year, and that's really related to the fact that a management analyst position is currently open, and that role will administer the registration and reservations process. Uh, the, our communications officer will assist with program branding and regular promotion. And I really uh, want to take a moment to recognize my, my colleague, Chris Myers, because facilities department uh, will be uh, facilitating and coordinating deliveries and pickups, uh, which is a significant part of this program as well. So it truly is uh, a, shared, a shared lift and uh, exciting uh, to offer uh, from all departments. Uh, so with that, staff recommends City Council approve the Citrus Heights Community Block Party Trailer Program Guidelines, and I will open it up for any questions. Um, if we could hold off on questions or comments and uh, take the public comment from Michael Lager Messino. Good evening, members of the City Council and Megan. Uh, Megan and I met Tuesday, I believe. Uh, she asked if I'd be if I'd be willing to come up and speak for or against this program. Uh, from what I've seen so far, from what Megan's presented and my previous conversations with her uh, at, at City Hall, uh, I can't see anything bad about this, as long as the people that rent it return it in the condition in which they got it. Uh, I'm responsible for the volunteer trailer uh, with, at PD. Um, and I know how much it takes to maintain the trailer at times. However, uh, it's definitely doable. I think it's a great opportunity for the uh, city to get out. And Megan, I would like to for you to consider, if you haven't already, Sunday Fun Day, putting it with uh, necessary information uh, in the park. For Count on it. Monday. Absolutely. So uh, that way you get in the word out, they'll see the trailer, and it's a great opportunity to promote it myself. Uh, as you know, I do sit on several other places, uh, but this is not recommending from anything else but my own personal recommendation. I would like to recommend the City Council seriously consider this and approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Steve, you had a comment? Uh, some questions. Um, now, this is a rental, and I know these are guidelines, but as we are wont to do, I want to get down in the weeds. What's what's the rental cost? Do we have any, um, and, and what's the magnitude of the insurance? I just, um, it seems like a, a great <coughs> idea is getting very expensive. And permits, I mean, and I think those are already set. We can't have a, a separate policy on the permit fees. Correct. Permit, uh, permit costs are set. Our intention is to offer the community block party uh, trailer program free of charge. And I can't speak to private event insurance, uh -huh. but currently the event insurance that the city offers is $134. Yeah, that's not too bad. It's based on attendee, and the mm. minimum is sure. 125 that for, for 100 people or less. Is that a million or two million we asked for? It's a million with two, two million aggregate. Okay. Um, I would suggest just in the language, uh, uh, not return it Monday morning, but the next business day would kind of cover all circumstances, including holidays, Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, that's the weeds part. Um, I think that's all the questions I had was the, the costs. Um, Mike mentioned... Uh, 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 cleaning issues. Uh, is there going to be a cleaning deposit or, or anything along those lines? Or is that, see how it goes? Yeah, since this is uh, the pilot of the program, we can certainly see how it goes. As part of the application bundle, we will include a code of conduct so that shared expectations are very clear um, that we return things the way we received them. 
Uh, and then certainly uh, we will make note uh, in each transaction the, the, what we are experiencing and if we need to make modifications, we certainly can. Chris, as uh, uh, the equipment expert, do you have anything to add to that? No, they'll have an inventory sheet that they'll be gone over with every time that we drop that off, and then we'll go through that when we pick it up with them that they have to sign off on it, just like you have a small event. Same, same process. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Megan? Mr. Daniels? Um, yeah, Council Member Miller whacked down all my weeds, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on that language right there of uh, no sooner than six months and no later than two weeks, and maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but then it says on the bottom, all paperwork, want, you want it all, all to be in with no less than 30 days. Um, yeah, that yeah, that is, that is conflicting. Okay, good, because I thought I'm not just reading. No, the, the math like doesn't that. add up. Uh, let's, let's call it 30, just, <laughs> just and, make sure we've got know, the time. And, and I understand you want it at 30, but I hope if somebody comes in and they, you know, they got something that came up and they want to do something in 25 days or something like that, that we can look at that and, and try to make that work. But certainly we want to get it in as soon as possible. But um, sometimes things just come up and somebody, you know, some sort of celebration that wasn't thought about pops up and, and we want to do something. Yeah. I would hope that we don't close the door and, and, and say, no, nope, that's uh, nine days. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> the goal is community connection. So we'll do whatever we can to achieve that. On the flip side of the coin, it was important to us to put that reservations are based on availability because we are also working with internal staff bandwidth. Um, especially in the facilities department with drop off and pick up. Well, so this doesn't have anything to do. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Great work on this. So I'd just like to dovetail on uh, council members uh, uh, Daniel's comments, and that is, it, if you're trying to promote something like this, and you're trying to do it, unless you're trying to promote and get people to come out in less than 30 days, you know, try to put this together in two weeks and have somebody actually show up. Yeah. 30 days is very reasonable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. To plan a good party. Yeah, absolutely. Or a banana split party. Oh. Well, that's true. Having planned many events in my lifetime, it's almost impossible to plan an event of any magnitude in 30 days. So um, I think that's a fair parameter. Um, I had a thought. Oh, I'm very happy to see that we're going to do this, at least initially, without charge. I would highly recommend, though, that we do take a deposit, just like we do at the community centers when we rent it. Mm -hmm. Deposit gets returned after the event if everything is fine. So I would I recommend that we come up with a, a, a dollar amount for a deposit with the intention of returning it unless they damage something, because we have to cover that. The other thing I want to just comment on I know that we have to have our ducks in a row with insurance and all of those parameters, but I'm hoping that the application itself will not be undaunting, that it will be something that the average person can get through in a short period of time without feeling overwhelmed by the magnitude of the application process. Absolutely. We are totally committed to that. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Can't wait for it to happen. Okay. What's the will of the council? Well, then I, I uh, with that and having said that, I would like to move approval of the Block Party Trailer Program as presented. I second. Okay, a motion by Bruins, second by Schaefer, Vice Mayor Schaefer. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Ooh. Yay, party time. <laughs> Next item, please. The next item is regular calendar item number nine. The subject is approval of memorandum of understanding with the Life Foundation related to the Auburn Oaks facility at 7501 Sunrise Boulevard. Staff recommends to the adoption of a resolution authorizing the city to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Life Foundation related to the Auburn Oaks affordable senior housing project and approve the memorandum of understanding. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, Ashley Finney, your City Manager, along with City Attorney Ryan Jones, will be presenting this item tonight. Uh, we do have some presentation slides that are coming up. And uh, as Ms. Van said, this is a request for approval of a resolution to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Life Foundation, the Auburn Oaks Senior Apartments. There's been some media discussion in the community about that. 
Uh, so tonight we're really here to give an overview in open session and hit the highlights on what this is. Um, but just to get by way of background, if we go to the first slide here, uh, back in June, early summer, June 2022, uh, Life Foundation contacted the city about an opportunity to pursue a collaborative grant application. There's a grant program called the Community Care Expansion Program, and what that provides for are acquisition opportunities where there can be a facility that, uh, you know, helps with senior housing or really kind of helps prevent homelessness from happening, keeps people in their homes. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a great program. We haven't seen it used a lot in this area of the state. It's been used in Southern California and in, in Northern California, but in, in our region, we haven't seen a whole lot of it, but it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity that we've learned quite a bit about over the last couple of months. Um, in June and July of this year, our staff and had a number of introductory meetings with the Life Foundation and really kind of dug into this grant program as well as the proposal. And on August 11th, the city council gave direction uh, to the city manager to execute a non-binding letter of intent that laid out some general terms that were um, provided that would then be put into a binding memorandum of uh, understanding, which is here for, for you tonight. So if we can go to the next slide. A little bit about the property history. It was uh, built in 1975. It uh, was built as a senior residential facility. It was owned by the Zimmerman family for, well, Quite a, quite a bit of time there, uh, 45 years. Uh, in the early 80s, it was converted from senior residential facility to assisted living, immediate care facility. Basically, it served seniors in the community for a very long time. Uh, it was acquired in 2020. Goodwill entered into a lease in 2020 as well. And it's currently serving as a combination of uh, independent and semi-independent units. And when the semi-independent units are spoken to, they receive some communal food provision. So that's currently what's being operated under that Goodwill lease structure. Uh, it was listed for sale this year, and it's currently under contract for acquisition by the Life Foundation. 130 total units. You can see a picture of it here. It actually has a 3% vacancy rate. So... You can see there's quite a bit of demand for this property, and as I mentioned before, uh, senior serving. Uh, by way of orientation, uh, it is just south of the intersection of Old Auburn Road and Sunrise Boulevard. It's outlined in the uh, red dashes uh, on this aerial here. But you can see it's proximate to Citrus Heights Plaza, which has a lot of neighborhood serving uses. There's a McDonald's, a couple of gas stations nearby, and there's also the Sunrise Point project uh, across the street, which this council is familiar with. This is just a site plan that we pulled up. We thought we would just orient uh, the council and the community to the site. Uh, you can see it has a parking lot that wraps as well as some large landscape areas. Uh, there's a two-story building on the north side of the property, and then there's a single-story uh, units uh, to the south. And this is an older site plan. As I mentioned, the current configuration is approximately 130 units. Uh, one thing to note is, you know, who would this serve? In the staff report, we had income uh, levels spoken to as well as anticipated rents. But this is senior population market data. Uh, and senior, from an age qualification standpoint, it seems like a young age to me, but 55 plus is where that starts. And as you can see in here, if you go through those first four income categories, uh, just north of 50,000, would qualify for the low income uh, and there's various income levels but basically those four income categories those first four those constitute approximately 33 percent of the age qualified households within citrus heights and you can see this data was pulled from uh, the radius ring uh, to the right of the um, up to the spreadsheet there and so it's very citrus heights centric three mile trade area around there uh, project goal, we, the goal of the Life Foundation and the city as proposed is to ensure the property remains in service to the senior community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, City Attorney Jones, who will go over the salient terms of the MOU. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. I wanted to highlight a few of the key terms in the memorandum of understanding that we're asking the council or recommending the council to adopt via resolution tonight. 
we have negotiated these terms and we find them to be fair and, and reasonable, especially um, from the perspective of the city. The first part is the city would collaborate with Life Foundation to pursue the grant that Mr. Feeney talked about, the Community Care Expansion Grant. We would be the sponsoring entity in that grant. Also, Life Foundation, they would be the owners of the land and they would be the ones that would be responsible for both the management and operation of the senior housing project as opposed to the city. Though the city does have a role in that in the sense that we can review and have approval rights for any changes in the management company as uh, throughout the, the course of that property. And lastly, I think this is important, or final on this slide, important I think to the city council and to our constituents is there's no city funds being contributed to this um, project. Next slide, please. So the Life Foundation would provide, another benefit is they'd provide some community health education programs for both youth and families, again, local to Citrus Heights. Also, depending on, assuming there's gonna be some cash flow that comes from the residents that pay rents there, the Life Foundation is looking to donate up to $100,000 annually to nonprofits in the region as directed by the city council. And then at the conclusion of, if the MOU is for a 20 year, memorandum of understanding is for a 20 year term. At the end of that term, two things can happen. One is if they find somebody else to continue on and use it in a very similar fashion to continue to serve seniors, that would be the case. But if not, it could be sold. And the proceeds from that sale, which would be significant, we would anticipate, would come back to the city in the sense that we, would, we have the ability to distribute them to supporting local nonprofits in the region. Now, all this is contingent upon the grant being um, awarded. And these are the key terms of the Memorandum of Understanding. And next slide. We are recommending as staff to approve the resolution, and the resolution would give the city the ability to enter into the Memorandum of Understanding that we just talked about. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Any questions? Any comments? So full disclosure, my wife is a director of care for a, a fairly large assisted living um, facility. Um, and one of the things that I've learned over the years of living with her is there's an incredible amount of confusion when it comes time to, to for a parent to be placed if there's no, um, if there's no, um, no relatives involved at what point does that person decide, okay, it's time to move into this type of facility? Um, and it's quite expensive. It's very, very expensive, as a matter of fact. It, uh, I think about on the low end, it's about 5,000 a month, going up to $15,000 a month. Um, so it's great that we are, um, we're getting involved in this. I think this is uh, uh, a wonderful thing. I, I do wonder, what people do when they don't, when they can't fund that kind of living expense. Um, I am curious about the um, 40 beds of skilled living, uh, of skilled uh, nursing facility. Is that? I don't think that exists now. Oh, that does not yeah, exist now. Original. That would be the future. No, that, that was, was original. That was, oh, that was originally, yeah. okay. So this is strictly independent living now. That's correct, it's independent living, but as the um, operation plan as well as the management company, to the extent there are, like say, an extremely low income household, there would be some wraparound services for those folks, but that original site plan, that is a, a site plan from the 90s. It was just for an example purposes. It's not in that configuration, it's current state. Okay, all right, that's clear, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to make sure the public understands what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, this is not a homeless shelter, okay? So any buzz out there on social media and that kind of thing, uh, it just needs to stop. But what this is, is the ability to step up and do what needs to be done for what we see happening, you know, in our, in our city, our county, our state, our nation, and that is people getting to a point to where there's no place to live, you know, and so... Um, this is what creates that, and this is this keeps 130 people, and I don't know if you can share a room. I don't know if couples can share rooms, but at least 130 people from that, from ending up on the streets. And and nothing breaks my heart more than seeing some senior person on the street. My God, you know, and I, it makes me just wonder, you know, where's their family, where's their friends, whatever. But but this will keep that 
um, this will keep that from not happening. So, so I'm very happy and proud actually to support this. I hope this goes through. I hope to God this goes through. But I think it's extremely important for the community to understand um, what we are doing and what we're not doing. Completely different things. This is something that will be a nice thing, hopefully. They'll be operated by good people, um, and it'll be a great opportunity for people to have some place to live and not have to be concerned about where they're going to live tomorrow. So. Okay. What's the will of the council? I will move approval of the memorandum of understanding with the Life Foundation. I second. Motion by Daniel, second by Vice Mayor Schaefer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? So moved. Next item, please. The next item is department reports, and there are none. The next item is city manager items. All right, just a few updates here. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, one thing that we wanted to, uh, we'll certainly be having on our web page and, and putting out there is uh, typically at the end of August, uh, the council will not hold their uh, last meeting in August, but we're doing that this evening. <laughs> and so, um, and we, we went ahead and did that because of the September 8th meeting falls uh, when the League of Cities Conference is being held. And so that's, uh, that meeting's being canceled. And our next city council meeting will be on September 22nd. Uh, this is a this is a great moment here. The city was recognized. Our, our general services team at the uh, Sacramento chapter of American Public Works Association for the Mariposa Safe Routes to School project, and that was a, uh, a great example of a successful partnership between the city, uh, the school district, surrounding neighborhood residents, and, and neighborhood association reps, and. Again, I know the council's well aware of this, but that's a culmination of about 20 years worth of work that was celebrated there. So kudos to the team, and you can even see, uh, looks like Leslie Bloomquist uh, was there in spirit. <laughs> she couldn't be there that day, but, uh, but it was fun to, to have her being part of the picture. So great job, team. And then uh, we have the exciting news on Police Academy graduates. Uh, police officer recruits Matthew Ingbreston and Andre O'Neill, excuse me, graduated from the uh, Sacramento County Sheriff Office's Police Academy on August 22nd. Uh, they've received the uh, Citrus Heights Police Office badges at their graduation ceremonies. You can see Chief Turcott was in attendance, and they're beginning their uh, field training program next week. So uh, two new officers coming on. And that concludes my comments. Uh, next item, please. Next item is items requested by council members or future agenda items. I do have an, an item. Okay. So uh, I'm following uh, Thomas Spencer's suggestion. I would like to look uh, for us to look at naming that park on Greenback Lane. I'll support that. Naming the park on Greenback Lane. Oh. Did, Chris, didn't it have a name? No? <laughs> Duplex Park. Okay, I've got two out of three. I'll be the third. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. let's, let's, why let's, don't we let's leave it, it to our yeah. economic development and director to put together or someone to put together a way to do that? I would say it's, as long as it's not after a person. You know, some community input or something, you know. Yeah. Name that park. Okay. We'll, we'll bring that item back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item. Next item are two closed session items. Um, so at this time, council would adjourn to closed session. Okay, we'll be adjourning. Okay.